talk is uh, an opinion piece. It would be a polemic, but I'm Canadian and a little bit polite. So, <laughs> and also I would have a lot of text, and I didn't want to do that. So the Hieronymus Bosch or Garden of Earthly Delights shows up so that you have something to look at and meditate on while I'm talking. <laughs> Two weeks at a comedy show I was hosting, a rare moment of beauty appeared, and I was part of the machinery that shut it down. Uh, an open mic comic brought on stage with him a box that contained the ashes of his mother, who had passed five months previous. I didn't know this was going to happen. Uh, he did some jokes with his mother's remains right there on the table in front of the audience. Uh, they were not particularly good jokes, because he's still wrestling with this whole thing, and it's not all connected. Uh, but I knew immediately that the ashes were genuine and that everyone in the room, including myself and him, was just staring at death and grief and inevitability and reality. And then anything could happen in that field of possibility. Something new could happen. The bottom fell out of the scene. And he finished kind of awkwardly and then I got up to introduce the next comic, and in that moment, I was sort of aware that I was doing something that I was destroying something that I actually value. Because the next comedian deserves to have the room that they practice for, and it's my job as the host that the show goes on. So I said a few things that were funny, and I re took back ownership of the room from his dead mother. So I recuperated the situation. In the 1960s, art group Situationist International used the term recuperation to describe the process by which politically radical ideas and images are twisted, co-opted, absorbed, diffused, incorporated, annexed, or commodified within media culture and bourgeois society, and thus become interpreted through a neutralized, innocuous, or more socially conventional, conventional perspective. You can see recuperation in the way that pride parades started, pride protests, I'm sorry, are now parades and are now also uh, commercial endeavors for an entire month as well as still a protest in some way. Or if you're a Shakespeare fan, and especially if you're a queer Shakespeare fan, you know that a Shakespearean comedy is a play that ends with a marriage. And the reason why it ends with a marriage is that it provides the audience with assurance that whatever conflicts arise in the play will not have lasting negative consequences for the protagonist or for the society at large. For instance, if you take like As You Like It or Twelfth Night, both plays where there is uh, uh, people playing people of other gender and there's a lot of queer shenanigans, at the end there's a marriage. Now to uh, a polite and heterosexual society, that is a recovery, that is a recuperation of what just happened in the play. To everyone who's queer, it's a slap in the face. My opinion is that recuperation is a pernicious trend in LARPs and it stems from an over-reliance on pop culture references to guide action the player desire to play out specific character arcs, and the attempts to commodify and widen LARP's appeal, such as making sandbox LARPs out of bingeable IP. I also think that while escapist fun has its place, not addressing these player tendencies can hamper a designer's wish to create a LARP that has political potential. Uh, when it comes to Netflix, in my house I am nicknamed Film Guy. Uh, because I have a tendency to watch 10 minutes of a new show and say, OK, those two are going to bang. Uh, he's going to die. He's going to have this like uh, servant of two masters arc with he gets betrayed in the seventh act. And then she's left bat at the end because she's a badass. And I'm not always right, but it's far enough away from zero times uh, that I worry about the state of the art. <laughs> because the formula is simply evident, and foreshadowing is all over the place. Everything is about recognizing something that happened somewhere else and will happen again. Now, with LARP's improvised storytelling comes the need for communication shortcuts, stereotypes and cliches that work because they are shorthand that the audience all understands, especially when LARPing internationally. We often find that the fastest way to common ground is through popular culture. And we use the fast way to connect, rather than build a new connection organically. This isn't new. Stock characters in the Comedia dell'arte, for example, developed partially because audiences didn't always speak the same dialects or languages. And so an archetypal villain with a heart of gold was a known story to tell that everyone would get. So if fellow players come in to help you do your plot, 
you have to rely on shared understanding. And there's very little time to negotiate in a LARP beyond a few words. And so you rely on what you already know. And if you know that betrayal works like this or that romance works like that, you will both fall back to that because you're executing a known story rather than discovering a new one. You rely on existing social structures instead of challenging them. The worst expression of this for me is the character arc, which is a problem for two reasons. One is that you have to have some idea, a knowledge of the LARP of your character, uh, of the, the arc of your character, and then you pre-influence your character's choices before you have even tried to embody them in their social milieu. And then two, they end with a resolution, which is very often recuperation. So how many times do you hear in the last couple hours of a LARP that players are anxious to wrap up their story? Wrap up what exactly? You want to turn that newly living and breathing set of possibilities into something you can package and understand. You want them to get married at the end and discard the chaos that truly made them. And this spreads quickly among players because if everybody else is doing a resolution, you should do one too. So the bottom cannot fall out when everyone is on their own little railroad. This makes LARP fall into the realm of kitsch. Uh, we know it as like cheesy, mass-produced, mass-recognizable art culture. Uh, of course, when you use mass culture to produce other culture, you get the same thing. Uh, Thomas, Tomasz Kulka's book, Kitsch and Art, he, he defines art, uh, kitsch as uh, depicts a beautiful or highly emotionally charged subject. He says, number two, the depicted subject is instantly and effortlessly identifiable. Number three, kitsch does not substantially enrich our associations related to the depicted subject. I say you could take this to LARP and say, number one, the play depicts highly emotionally charged subjects and stories. Number two, the character arcs, narratives, and themes are instantly and effortlessly recognizable. Uh, number three, the play does not substantially enrich our associations related to the depicted subject. So LARP is one of the few collective tools we have to play out new societies and to more deeply discover societies that are fading out of memory. But the more we go into these LARPs with the goal to maintain the status quo, the less potential for collective discovery and thus political power. I think the most successful LARPs in to let the bottom fall out have been LARPs such as Capo, uh, which actively resisted any kind of resolution in many ways, including having each player's LARP and end individually and at a different, not predetermined time. And I think we can still derive inspiration from other art. If you take the stories of someone like Ursula K. Le Guin, her social science fiction explores different, radically different societies through the actions and emotions of her characters. And anyone who's a fan of Ursula K. Le Guin knows that in radically different societies, emotions also work differently, and the actions taken are different. And it's clear that Melon Himmel Akhav was a LARP that disrupted players' ideas of relationships by enforcing that strangeness. So I would say that if you go to a LARP with this kind of box around it. We talk about LARP as being co-created, but I would say that these LARPs are co-executed. And I want to leave a little bit of inspiration, leave with a bit of inspiration from a 20th century film critic of all people, uh, Manny Faber. He contrasted what he called this masterpiece status-seeking art, white elephant art, with something called termite art, which he liked. And he said, the most inclusive description of the art is that termite-like. It feels its way through walls of particularization, not generalization, particularization, with no sign that the artist has any object in mind other than eating away the immediate boundaries of his art and turning these boundaries into conditions of the next achievement. I think that's what the comedian did with his mother's ashes. I would like a LARP meta technique that says, stop, listen. Let us eat our way through the boundaries of this scene. Thank you.